Okay, having covered some uh, a broad overview of assessment where we start to organize what we're assessing using some frameworks and a taxonomy. I'm going to get down into a few key ideas around assessment as well because this really starts to inform our strategies both around our instructional strategies as well as assessment strategies. So let's look at formative and summative assessment. Uh, and how those help us evaluate students and create feedback loops, in part because this also starts to inform things like how we address issues like cheating and motivation. So to understand the difference between formative and summative assessment, typically what happens is we kind of go along throughout a class for a while, and then we give students a test. Um, and in higher ed in particular, this is, <laughs> we're rather bad about this, um, that we talk a lot as we go and then we give a test to students at the end of the year. Um, this is summative assessment, anything uh, where we are assessing learning at the end of the year or at the end of a learning event is summative assessment. Perhaps we integrate a little bit of assessment like midterm and, uh, you know, at some point throughout as well. But the real question to ask here is do students receive some sort of feedback that allows them to adjust? So are they being assessed and then given feedback so that they can then continue to improve and apply that going forward? Or are they simply being assessed like on a midterm exam and they get a result out of that rather than a uh, feedback that informs improvement. Um, if they don't receive some sort, of fee some sort of feedback that allows them to adjust, and that's summative, if they do receive some sort of feedback that allows them to adjust, then that's more formative assessment. So summative assessment measures learning at the conclusion of a class or a learning event or a unit or something like that. It is evaluative. Uh, so like a final course grade or a final exam grade, midterm exams or end of a unit exam, things like that are evaluating. Where is a student at in this point of time? It uh, can inform decisions on achievement or effectiveness of the course or programs um, or course placement and decisions, graduation and things like that. But it's not used to inform students on their learning and how to improve. Um, so this summative assessment is can be thought of as um, assessment and information and results for us, for decision makers. Um, and formative assessment is assessment for students and for learning. If you are only using summative assessments, and especially if it's only once or twice um, a course, then this contributes to a high stakes environment. And that's one of the conditions that we know actually starts to become favorable to cheating. So uh, if you want to lower the stakes, and increase the support for meaningful learning, the formative assessment can actually help you with that. So let's consider, uh, you know, we've got this standard design and, you know, this is, these are like maybe weeks of instruction uh, and then a summative assessment. Well, what you'll want to do is integrate in, identify different opportunities. Uh, and this actually reflects one of my course designs when I have some different formative assessment opportunities. So students submit something to me. Um, and what that does is, first of all, that helps lower the stakes of anything that's summative. So that decreases that um, high stakes sense of uh, the environment that can create stress and leads students to uh, engage in cheating behavior. And it also happens throughout the course. So rather than happening once or twice, it's, it's a feature of the course design. And I actually design my courses around this idea of formative assessment. I actually start with formative assessment as a design principle. So students submit something. Uh, maybe it's very preliminary here, like in this course, in the case of this course I'm, I'm basing this on, 
they submit a preliminary proposal for what they're going to work on and I provide them some feedback which includes this is an appropriate topic this is not an appropriate topic this is too big this is too small <laughs> how are you thinking about this um, and then I break a project down into different deliverables that they work on so they have a little bit of time to work on those like through discussions and small group activities and then they submit a project to me and I provide them more feedback um, and then they can iterate on that piece of it and they also continue to work on additional parts of the project submit it again I provide additional feedback they continue to they can take that feedback work on it iterate on it continue to build other pieces into it submit it again to me you know maybe get a final feedback loop I don't always do four feedback loops um, but sometimes you know I'll build in a final cycle or maybe I'll turn this into a peer review cycle so it's not just me giving that formative feedback um, and then once they get some feedback and have a little bit of time to do some quick polish on it then they submit it uh, as a summative assessment at that point so like I said, you can think of formative more as, rather than being assessment of learning, which is what a summative use, use uh, usually is, it's more assessment for learning. How are we using assessment to actually support and inform the student's learning process? Uh, throughout this, what we wanna do is focus on providing strategy-focused feedback on what to improve rather than um, error-focused feedback, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. And this can be used as a diagnostic as well as for progress monitoring. Um, so it gives you opportunities to go in and identify early, okay, where are students at? How are they understanding things? What do they really need? How am I going to give them the supports that they need so that they can continue pro progressing towards the goal? <clears throat> Now, of course, you could merge these where, say, you've got, um, and this should be a smaller circle, but, you know, you could definitely merge these ideas where you've got some iterative feedback loops um, for them working on things, and you also are merging a couple of summative assessments throughout as well, like a midterm and a final. So let's talk about feedback, um, because feedback is a critical component, especially a formative assessment. And when you use formative assessment to provide feedback, it can be one of the most powerful instructional strategies that you use. But we've learned from research that we have to be very careful about the nature of the feedback that we provide. So these are just some quotes from students about, um, you know, uh, feedback from students <laughs> about classes saying, I really appreciate providing my instructor providing detailed feedback uh, on meaningful assignments uh, and very quickly, again, these, you know, tight turnarounds. Um, the teachers of the classes are supportive and interactive. The feedback was specific. Um, this one talks about uh, a lot of different aspects of an online class, but in general, I also appreciate a lot of teacher feedback on forum posts and assignments, um, as well as those who reached out individually to create a dialogue throughout the class. So um, we know both from research and students will tell you as well, F especially in online learning, feedback is like a... Um, a key idea to making a class engaging and also in generating meaningful learning. So what we see from a research perspective is that when we provide students strategy focused feedback, it increases the transfer of their learning. Again, talking about um, active knowledge instead of inert. Um, it increases this idea of social presence and decreases the sense of distance, which we're going to talk about more tomorrow. <clears throat> that leads to increased student satisfaction with uh, the learning environment and also helps address issues with motivation or confidence. And by the way, I should note um, the research that I'm really uh, citing back behind these statements um, are all on online learning. Uh, so this is certainly true for classroom based learning as well. But I think it's important for you to know that I'm not citing research on classroom-based learning here. I'm citing research on online learning. Okay, so feedback is critical, and we want to make sure that we give the right type of feedback as well. So the feedback that we give should be strategy-focused feedback. In other words, 
try to focus your feedback on what is strong. Uh, you know, in other words, you're telling a student, a student, this is working. You did a great job here. Keep doing this or keep doing things like this. And then here are the things that need attention and what you can do about it. That may be anything from, um, you know, consult a reference on uh, writing strategies or citation formats to why don't you try using this model or one of these models or frameworks that we've learned in our class to help you frame and organize this section. Or it might even be giving them an example and say, you know, take a look at how this person did it and um, specifically draw attention to what's strong, what's good about that. We, what we have learned from research on feedback is that error-focused feedback tends to actually be very demotivating and can lead to decreased learning and performance. Um, sometimes that's very difficult. I get it. I used to teach writing and grammar. And so a lot of that, of course, is marking up uh, grammatical issues and things like that. But as you might know yourself, maybe you've experienced yourself, getting a paper back with all of these errors noted on it can be really frustrating and, and deflating. Um, and yes, sometimes that's very important and you may want to incorporate some degree of that, but be very careful in how you use error-focused feedback and really try to make a dramatic shift if you haven't already towards more strategy-focused feedback in what you provide your learners. So if you're combining this idea of formative assessment with strategy-focused feedback, I think you can start to see now how assessment isn't just an assessment strategy, it's also an instructional strategy. And in online classes, we find that it's a great combination. It keeps folks engaged. It makes them feel like they're learning, like they're connecting with other people's. Um, it's social, but it's focused on the content. So they're interacting, but they're learning at the same time. Um, this may feel like a change in your role as an instructor, because um, what you look like as an instructor when you use these kinds of strategies may be very different from what you're used to. If you're used to presenting information, um, online happens to be a medium that's really good at presenting information for you. So if you think about these very videos that you're watching, um, what I've done is, of course, I'm recording videos and I'm letting the computer essentially present the information for me so that uh, after I've recorded this once, I don't have to go back through and keep presenting information. It actually frees up my time and that allows me to change my role as an instructor so that after I get through the recording, which if you've gone through your first class, I get it. It's very time intensive. Um, from that point forward, though, you can start to focus your time and uh, your cognitive energy on uh, discussions and feedback and interactions and supports with students. Um, so, and this strategy tends to support that kind of change in your role. Some tools to use for that, and this is just a quick brainstorming. There are other tools we can use. Um, but in a lot of learning management systems, uh, there's usually a grading option where you can comment on submissions and provide written or audio feedback uh, on work. In fact, we have a feature like that in Canvas if you'd like to submit something there and test it and see and get some audio or written feedback from me on something. We can certainly give it a go so you can see how an assessment tool like that works in Canvas. Um, or, or it, you know, or might work in another LMS as well. Um, feedback via discussions. Um, you know, if you're going to have a discussion, make sure you're present and providing students uh, feedback and support there. And of course, you could also use synchronous tools for either live class meetings as a whole class, small group meetings, or even host office hours for students to come in, show you what they're working on, you know, and talk with you about the work that they're developing um, as they're going. Direct application is another uh, significant component of this, uh, of um, using formative assessment in particular. So again, these are just some quotes from students. I, I like putting it into the student voice. So, uh, you know, I can cite the research, but I think it helps to hear in student words as well. 
uh, in their own words, how important direct application is. So um, being able to take things or, you know, learning something that's relevant. Of course, these are from adult learners, so they're talking about application to on the job. But of course, in civics education, there's a lot of this that should be directly applicable to their lives. Um, where they can immediately see the relevance or connection around them. So direct application is a great strategy to use, especially to help with motivation. So again, from a research perspective, we see that using direct application as an instructional strategy increases transfer of learning. Again, making knowledge active instead of inert, not just knowing something, but being able to do something with that. It increases student satisfaction with the learning experience as we see here. It addresses issues with motivation and uh, what well, it, it addresses issues with motivation in particular, um, relevance and confidence. So it helps students develop confidence, which motivates them more and they see the direct relevance to their everyday lives or maybe to work or the future work that they will be doing. So as you think about going through what I presented in these first few videos and how to start uh, applying that <laughs> to your own classes, um, a good place to start would be to go through your own course objectives and classify them using Bloom's taxonomy. If you haven't done this already, then, uh, or if you haven't written your objectives already, then maybe this is a good time to do so. And you could use Bloom's to help you structure those and write objectives in uh, each of those domains or the ones that make sense for your class. And then for each of your objectives, start to map it out to um, appropriate types of assessment using like the slides from today that we've talked through. Um, I've given you an empty table on this page. You could make notes there, or you could certainly recreate this in a Word document and map things out there. Um, but that way, I think this helps us start to identify, okay, uh, my objectives fall under, you know, remembering or understanding, or maybe I want to do some more analysis or, uh, you know, creating something. And so I want to, here's how I want to assess that. And that'll help us start to identify our assessment strategies and our instructional strategies. And like I said, then that can help us inform selecting technology.